Upsilon Andromeda is a binary star system that deserves to be talked about a lot more than it is, consisting of one star bigger than the sun, a small red dwarf on a wide orbit, and three super Jovian gas giants, all at a relatively close 44 light years from Earth. This system is one of the most interesting we've ever discovered. But it's not talked about very often, so that's what I'm here to do. Welcome to episode 4 of my Grand Tour series, where I go over specific exoplanet systems in more depth. This one will be about Upsilon Andromedae, and a bit shorter than the others, since there's only three planets in the system, as opposed to the seven of Trappist-1 and five of 55 Cancri. However, we do know a surprising amount of information about all three worlds, so even though there's fewer planets and systems I'd usually cover for a Grand Tour episode, the fact that we know so much about all of them made this episode worth it. When you're done watching this, also check out my other Grand Tour episodes, A Grand Tour of Alpha Centauri, Trappist-1, and 55 Cancri. Also suggest other systems you want covered as a Grand Tour in the comments. At face value, the Upsilon Andromeda Stellar System seems like a bigger version of 55 Cancri, one star with a smaller red dwarf on a wide binary orbit around it. All three known planets orbit the bigger of the two, an F-type star called Tidewin. Tidewin is also called Upsilon Andromeda A, but was given an official name along with the three planets in the 2015 Name Exoworlds competition, which my video called How to Name an Exoplanet talks about more. The red dwarf, Upsilon Andromeda B, doesn't have any known planets yet, and doesn't have a proper name either. I should also clarify that there are two objects called Upsilon Andromeda B in the system, same as there are two objects called 55 Cancri B in the 55 Cancri system. Upsilon Andromeda B, the star, has a capital B, and Upsilon Andromeda B, the planet, has a lowercase b. But the planet has been named Sapphire, and that's one of the reasons I only use the proper names of exoplanets instead of the designations, to avoid confusion like that. So if I say Upsilon Andromeda B, I'm talking about the star, and if I'm talking about the planet, I'll be using the proper name, Sapphire. Anyways, Tidewin is about 20% bigger than the Sun in mass, and Upsilon Andromeda B is about 20% of the Sun's mass. As far as I can tell, the orbit of Upsilon Andromeda B isn't known, but we can say with a good amount of certainty that it is orbiting Tidewin, because it's moving along with it and has a similar age of around 3.1 billion years. It's estimated to be at about 750 astronomical units away from Tidewin, but that's only a minimum distance, and it could be much larger. Other than that, almost nothing is known about Upsilon Andromeda B. But Tidewin is where things get more interesting. It's named after the Berber name for the city of Tedouan in Morocco, and it has at least three planets orbiting around it. I'm also probably mispronouncing that name. I've heard somewhere it's pronounced as Tidewin, but I've heard Tidewin in other places, so I'm not sure which one to use. I'm going to stick to using Tidewin for this video, since that's the pronunciation I learned when I first heard of the star, but if I'm wrong, just tell me in the comments. Based on the star's estimated age of around 3 billion years, combined with its large size, it's expected to either be currently moving off the main sequence phase and turning into a red giant, or is about to. Stars even 20% larger than the sun don't tend to live very long, and the planets in the system don't have very long left before their star becomes a red giant. Which brings me to the planets themselves. All three of Tidewin's planets are much bigger than Jupiter, the outer two bordering on brown dwarfs. With three planets this big in the system, other planets will have a hard time existing. Any Jupiter-sized planets closer than five astronomical units to the star would become unstable because of the gravitational forces of these three giants, and so are unlikely to exist. However, there are some orbits where rocky planets could remain stable, so the chances for additional planets isn't zero. But so far, only three are known, and I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't any others. The orbits of all three planets are also way different than the solar system planets have. In the solar system, and the vast majority of all discovered planetary systems, the planets all tend to orbit on the same plane, near the star's equator. The solar system's planets are all on a relatively flat disk, as are most systems, but not Upsilon Andromedae. As per this graph, the inclinations of these planets are all over the place. This is weird because planets all orbit in the same plane because of how systems form. When protoplanetary disks form, they flatten because they're spinning, which means that the orbit of the planet should also be relatively flat in relation to their star. So, something must have happened in the Upsilon Andromeda system for the planets to be like this. It's possible that because all these planets are so big, they interfere with each other's orbits, causing their inclinations to go all over the place. The Upsilon Andromeda planets interfering with one another will become a common theme later. Anyways, it's time for the first planet, Sapphire. Upsilon Andromeda b, lowercase b, officially named Sapphire, is the closest planet to Tidewin and the least massive known planet in the system, at 70% more massive than Jupiter. Like the other two planets, it's named after a Muslim astronomer from the 10th or 11th century. Sapphire's radius is about 80% larger than Jupiter's, and is likely so large because of the intense heat from its star causing it to puff up. I talk about this more in my recent video about puffball planets. 
Surprisingly, despite its planetary neighbors being 14 and 10 times more massive than Jupiter respectively, Sapphire is likely the largest planet in the system in terms of radius. This is because gas giants don't really grow much as mass increases unless it has a lot of heat, so the other two planets in the system are probably pretty similar to Jupiter in radius despite being much more massive. They have stronger gravitational pulls, pulling their atmospheres down and lowering their radius. Sapphire, the least massive planet, likely has the largest radius. Anyways, Sapphire takes just 4 days to orbit its star, making it a hot Jupiter with temperatures on the day side of over 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit, or 1,500 Celsius. However, observations from the Spitzer Space Telescope suggest that Sapphire is almost certainly tidally locked to Titowin, because the night side gets much colder. Temperatures on the night side could be well over 1,000 degrees colder than the day side, with night side temperatures ranging anywhere from 440 degrees Fahrenheit, or 230 Celsius, to negative 4 Fahrenheit, or negative 20 Celsius. There's a chance that Sapphire, the hot Jupiter over 20 times closer to its star than Earth is from the Sun, could have Earth-like temperatures on its night side. However, it's likely that this number is closer to 440 than negative 4. Not only that, but the color of Sapphire is known. Determining the color of exoplanets is exceedingly difficult, as you either need several years of observations and hordes of data to see how the starlight changes when the planet passes in front of it, or you need to directly image it. Sapphire was found to be blue in color, as a lot of hot Jupiters likely are, like Galileo, which I talk about in my Grand Tour of 55 Cancri. Sapphire is the most well-studied planet of the system, as planets closer to their stars are just easier to study. The next two planets are much further out. SAM, spelled S-A-M-H, orbits Titoin about 0.8 AU, similar to the distance Venus orbits the Sun. It also has a similar orbital period to Venus at around 240 days, far longer than the 4 days it takes Sapphire to make an orbit. SAM is much more massive than Sapphire at about 14 Jupiter masses, which is higher than the 13 Jupiter mass limit of a brown dwarf. But SAM is usually still considered to be a planet. An object being classified as a brown dwarf depends on more than its mass. It also depends on how it formed. Brown dwarfs form in the same way stars do, not through a protoplanetary disk. Because SAM likely form the way planets do, it's classified as a planet, despite meeting the IAU determined mass requirements to be a brown dwarf. SAM's orbit is also not circular. It has an eccentricity of about 0.26, meaning it's more of an oval-shaped orbit than a circle. The reason for SOM's strange orbit isn't known, and could be due to interactions with other planets in the system, but another guess suggests it might be because of a rogue planet. In this scenario, a rogue planet, or a planet that doesn't orbit a star, interacted with the Epsilon Andromeda system. It drifted close to Majority, the next planet in the system which we'll get to later, which caused it to slowly move closer to the star. This eventually caused the rogue planet to either be destroyed or ejected from the system, leaving Majority and Psalm to pull on each other with their massive gravity, eventually causing Psalm's orbit to become the shape it is today. Or, maybe a rogue planet isn't needed at all, and Majority just formed where it is now. In this case, simulations of the system show that Psalm's orbit is constantly changing, and because of gravitational interactions with Majority, becomes circular again every 9,000 years. For now, the cause of Psalm's orbit remains unknown. SOM hasn't been studied nearly as much as Sapphire, and because of this, its radius and temperature are unknown. But it's hotter than Earth, we know that for sure. It's also likely to be generating a large amount of internal heat because of its high mass, which will raise its temperature even more. Because of its high mass, SOM almost certainly hosts moons, but we haven't found any direct evidence of any, let alone confirmed any. But moons will be much more important for the third and final planet of the system, Majority. Majority is probably the most popular planet of the Upsilon Andromeda system. You might know it as Upsilon Andromeda D. But, like Sapphire and Psalm, it was given an official name in 2015. Majority is smaller than Psalm, but still incredibly massive, at about 10 times the mass of Jupiter. It has an eccentric orbit like Psalm, though it's significantly longer, taking about 1,270 days, or 3.4 Earth years, to complete. This puts it within the habitable zone of Titowin, and because of its elliptical orbit, it moves across pretty much the entire habitable zone, getting colder and hotter when it's at the furthest and closest points of its orbit. Because of Majority's existence, other planets in the habitable zone are likely impossible, as the planet's massive gravity would destabilize them. But like some, Majority likely has large amounts of moons, just based on its mass. Because larger planets tend to have larger moons, any hypothetical Majority and moons could potentially be as big as Mars or Earth. However, like SOM, there is no evidence of moons around Majority, because exomoons are extremely hard to detect. The lack of evidence doesn't mean moons don't exist, it just means we can't detect them yet, and haven't really tried. I've talked about other gas or ice giants in the habitable zones of stars, and I made a whole video about them, Hyshin planets and temperate ice giants. 
I've also covered them both in a grand tour of Alpha Centauri and 55 Cancri. But I've said in those videos that ice giants like Harriet and 55 Cancri are unlikely to host habitable moons because of their small size. Any moons of Harriet or Candidate 1 are probably small and airless, based on the moons of Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune in our solar system. But Majority doesn't have this problem, and is more than big enough to host planet-sized moons. So, the chances for habitable moons around Majority does exist, but there's still a lot of complications. Majority likely has a strong magnetic field, like Jupiter, the radiation belts of which could strip the atmospheres of inner moons like Jupiter does to Io. Io, despite being the most volcanically active object in the solar system, doesn't have an atmosphere because of Jupiter. If Io didn't orbit Jupiter but had the same level of volcanic activity, it would most likely have a very thick atmosphere. Because Majority is so much bigger, this could be even worse. Plus, the moons will be tidally locked to it, and we don't really know how longer day lengths would affect life. Just because an object is in the habitable zone doesn't mean it's likely to be habitable. Earth's moon is also in the habitable zone because it orbits Earth, and it's clearly not habitable. The moons Majority might have could easily have a whole host of other environments. They could be like Mars or Venus instead of Earth, for example. So, I wouldn't put the chances of Majority possessing habitable moons as very high, but the chance does exist, and of all the planets we've discovered, I think Majority is the most likely to host habitable moons. So, those are the three known planets of Upsilon Andromedae. But before I end this episode, there's one more planet to talk about, Upsilon Andromedae E. Upsilon Andromedae E, which was never given an official name since it was discovered after Safar, Sam, and Majority got their names, was a planet about the size of Jupiter in mass thought to exist in the system. If it had existed, it would have dethroned Safar as the least massive planet in the system. It also would have orbited Tidewin at about 5.2 AU, making it extremely similar to Jupiter in not only mass, but in orbit too. Unfortunately, new data suggests that Upsilon Andromeda E doesn't actually exist, and its detection was likely an artifact in the instruments used to find it. So, Upsilon Andromeda E is considered mostly disproven, but there is an extremely small chance it still does exist. It most likely doesn't, though. With that, that's pretty much it for Upsilon Andromedae. There haven't been any other asteroid belts or additional planets discovered around Tidewin, likely because Sam and Majority have cleared out the entire system with their gravities. Clearly, Upsilon Andromedae has been dramatically shaped by the planets in it. The entire system is dynamic and constantly changing because of the two borderline brown dwarfs relatively close to one another. The planets are large enough to significantly alter the orbits of other planets, leading to a system in a constant state of change, and there's still a lot to be explored in Upsilon Andromedae. Maybe one day we'll find additional planets in the system, or even habitable worlds circling Majority. We'll just have to wait and see. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, check out the rest of my Grand Tour series, and tell me what other systems should be covered in the comments.